there are often opportunities uh, where I'm asked to, to present the work of the firm. I usually start with a photograph of Oak Alley. Uh, my grandmother lived around the corner from Oak Alley, and I can remember as a young child visiting Oak Alley and driving um, up River Road, and the moment <clears throat> in the car as we're approaching, and you could see the Alley of Oaks from an angle, and the anticipation that you would have when you'd get on axis and everything would snap into place. And there's also a quote I will, I will add um, in it. It's a Faulkner quote, which is, the past is not dead. In fact, it's not even past. With the quote on the screen, tell a, a topical um, New Orleans joke, which is, um, how many New Orleanians does it take to change a light bulb? <clears throat> and of course, the answer is always three. One, to change the bulb, and two, to reminisce about how wonderful the old bulb was. In, in doing so, there is that conversation about how significant the past is here and how any work that we do today has to be in dialogue with the past. He was born in Crowley, and uh, his family moved to Lafayette, and he went to the second grade in school in Lafayette. So he really considers himself a native of Lafayette. And he graduated from Tulane with a degree in architecture. Earlier, he had received an engineering degree from uh, Southwestern in Lafayette. Uh, physically, he had the presence of like Alfred Hitchcock to that me. That would be accurate. You know, <laughs> to, you know, he had a little bit of a stomach and pants were kind of up high and, you know, definitely he was super nice but very eccentric. Dad used to talk about how, you know, his German Shepherd would sit at the table with him and share a meal. A little round roly-poly. Yes, he kind of was, you know, he wasn't a big man, and he had a little pooch, you know. Um, he was just so warm and friendly, and you know he didn't care anything about clothes. I'm sure he was wearing the same suit for 20 years, and it didn't bother him. He was all up in here and visual, you know. He had an Indian motorcycle, and he loved his Indian motorcycle. He went from Lafayette to Tulane to go to school on a motorcycle. And he said it was kind of dangerous because the roads weren't all paved. <laughs> My father, when he got out of Tulane, his first job was with N.W. Overstreet in Jackson, Mississippi. And he went in, you know, as low man on the totem pole. Uh, growing up, every time he didn't want to do something, he would get very frustrated and say, well, you have to do what you don't want to or you never get ahead. Just keep working. He was the youngest architect to be hired by a big firm in Jackson, Mississippi. And when times got hard, he knew he'd be the first to go. He said everybody else took off Saturday and Sunday and he went to work on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, kind of before you knew it, Mr. Overstreet made him a partner. Then it became Overstreet in town. And he worked there and built things. Uh, then his father died in Lafayette and his grandfather was dying, and he decided he needed to be closer to home. So we moved to Baton Rouge in 1939. He, uh, in the 1930s, of course, you had the Great Depression, the stock market crash. He was uh, uh, in charge of measuring historic buildings in Mississippi, where architects were hired to backwards engineer historic buildings so that uh, the premise being that if there was ever a war in the United States on our soil and our buildings were destroyed, we could rebuild them. So our, we wouldn't lose our culture. <laughs> My father always worked at home. I'm sure other people have told you his weird schedule that he lived, you know. He would go to bed at night and then he would get up around midnight and work in the middle of the night. Funniest thing about that is he would make that pitch black Lafayette coffee, drip it, 
and then he'd go wake my mother up, and she'd sit up and get a demi tasse of that pitch black coffee, lie back down, and go to sleep. And he would work. Um, he had so much energy, and he required very, very little sleep, which is the only way he could work as hard as he did and do his, build as many houses and buildings as he did, because during the day, he visited people. He'd go check job sites, but then he'd visit. On the way, he'd stop at a past client's house and go in and look at their drapes or look at their their chests they'd bought that he, they weren't sure about or meet the rug salesman over there to see if the rugs were right. So by the time night came, he'd sit down when there was no one to visit with at 2 in the morning and draw a set of plans. That's when he really worked. But he really liked children, and he really liked dogs. He liked grown people, too. I never did see the dog eat the dinner at the table, but I did go to his house with mom and dad a couple of times, and they were designing this house. And uh, while mom and dad were in his studio, I would go out and play with the dog. And, you know, uh, that dog was pretty much allowed anywhere in the house and could do anything. But he was very, I, I just re remember him as being, I mean, very kind, gentle. Yeah. Very unassuming. Mm -hmm. He was smaller than his older brother. His brother was an athlete, and he was not. And I think that pushed him to succeed in other areas. He was always an artist. He would have been an artist, but his daddy wouldn't let him. His father said, you'll never make a living, boy. You have to do something else. So that's when he went into architecture, which was great. There was a building my husband worked in that he had done. It's now been torn down, but it was very, very modern. So he, his style evolved with him. He built his houses for a family. And if you think back how long ago it was that he had a family room as opposed to a keeping room, but it was for the family and it was close to the kitchen or even part of the kitchen like they do in today's floor plans. His world was people. That's what he truly was. When we first met, we had a new baby, and then I found out I was pregnant for another one coming right after. It worked out beautifully because I said, put a bathroom between the two bedrooms downstairs. We put the boys upstairs. We had three. It worked out well that we were able to have it according to our needs, you know. He would have us come to Baton Rouge and take us around to see the houses that he had done and kind of get a feel of what we liked, you know. Mostly me, my husband didn't have so, so much to say. But um, yes, when he took us to his son's house and I saw the breakfast kitchen combination with the big table there, and he knew that's what I wanted, I think, by, by my reaction. I told him that I liked a lot of windows, not taking into consideration cleaning them, but he certainly listened. My parents were very friendly with Dr. Ed, Ed Bro in Lafayette, and they had the most wonderful back porch, back gallery. And that's when I said to Hayes, we want a back gallery, you know, a simple front with a nice back gallery. And that was what he was able to give us. When he was taking pictures, because he said, I'm going to do a book of my houses, I appeared in a little checkered shirt and, and skirt, and I was standing at the front door, and he was clicking away, and he said, you look like a little French maiden. I said, really? In his book of houses that he did, I'm the only figure in the book. So I feel very honored. One experience, Hayes was here talking to the carpenters, and he, he they had just put the mantle up. It was an old an old piece of wood, you know, and he told the carpenter, who was a little French man, and he said, I, I want you to put a few nail heads in it while I'm gone, and when I, I come back, we'll talk about the finish. He came back, and there were about 2,000 nail heads. He didn't mean that many, but he wanted to give it an aged effect. You know, but I think when he started doing houses, that's when he realized that's where he needed to be because of the connection with the people and their families. He was the first in Lafayette to really make an impact. Yeah. He built this house when I was uh, late in high school. And then uh, two years of college, that Gay and I got married, and so I had to move out. So I lived here about four or five years. 
I worked for him for for two years. I went in the army and came back and worked for him. And then we had a disagreement. I went in the construction business and started building houses then. We had to change it a little bit. Daddy didn't believe in closets back in the old days. Closets were very scarce and small. So we had a bunch of closets and another bathroom and stuff like that. Everything was nice, we just brought it more up to date. The studio was built after the house. He had a drawing board back there and he would take customers back there and work on their plans with them. But it's a much bigger room. We use it to entertain our family. We have a big family and we set up tables and feed everybody. The house was built with that wall there forward. And then he built a studio after and he built a building in the back and a pigeon there in the two room. And uh, I think he built a gazebo with that sight line down there with the house. He added bay windows all over this house. There's a bay window in the kitchen. There's a bay window in the dining room. There's a bay window in the back bedroom there. He, he improved the house. That was his hobby. I was hunting and fishing. He was working on his house. And I, I was the builder in, the, in this house, and uh, he was so very definite about anything. He would tell you to do something, and every now and then, after it was done, he would come and he'd look at it, he didn't like it. He'd have you do it over, all over again, and never think twice to apologize for having, uh, having had you to do that. That wasn't right, so we gotta do it right. And uh, he, uh, but he did give real good instructions. Uh, his, his plans, were, were, were good plans, but they, he did not detail his plans, and he purposely didn't, because he liked to see it as it went along and change what he wanted. He didn't want you to build it just like he had it. And that was very interesting. And it was, uh, he told me what lumber he wanted, and I'd have to find the lumber. And fortunately, at that time, they were tearing down a number of, of old New Orleans buildings, Right after that, the city stopped the teardowns, and you couldn't have gotten this material uh, that went into it. So it was fun. If you owned a Hayes house, there was an unspoken rule that people could come visit anytime they wanted to, meaning him. And he literally would just come in the door and check on things and check on families and spend time with them and look at their yards. And he would drive by a house that he had designed and pull in the driveway and come in and say, you, you need to paint your shutters. I've decided that they don't need to be this color. Let's change them this color. When we were going to look at his houses, we'd, we'd be driving around with him and he said, I want to show you something here. And without calling the people, he'd just go up to them and, and ring the doorbell and tell me once. And he'd have us right with him at the door saying he wants to show. And they were always real, seemed to be real happy to show, show their house. He was a special person, there's no question. I was so busy with children, I, I certainly didn't know much about architecture. I just knew a floor plan that would be suitable to my style of living. And when I gave him my floor plan, he improved on it. His clients were very important. It wasn't just draw a plan, give it to the contractor. He was very much involved in every bit of it. He was constantly teaching. You knew that whatever he said, it was gonna be the right thing because you trusted him. Both men and women, if there was a question, it was ask Hayes. Uh, the original plan of our home had four large columns and uh, our contractor at the time could not find anyone, a bricklayer, to do the brick that's required to do the, these columns. So he was thinking about wanting to do, you know, a fabricated column, which I didn't want. Well, amazingly, the uh, Hay Hayes Town Museum was being built with the columns all around. And my contractor found out who was doing the columns, because if you notice, it's a triangle brick. Those columns are brick masonry, right? And in 1967, you didn't need to do that and this is probably consistent with uh, any number of townhouses, there was a means by which you could build in a contemporary fashion 
Well, Town chose not to build in a contemporary fashion. He chose to build in a traditional fashion, all hand molded in order to achieve the Doric columns around the, around the house that are then plastered over. And it, it creates um, a solidity and a mass and a texture and a kind of quality in, in the way in which it picks up light that's very different than a machined column. I was so happy that we were able to follow the plan, the original plan of Hayes. And I like also the history with being the same time with the museum. I don't think you can be a practicing architect in Louisiana and not have uh, uh, an understanding of the importance of A. Hayes Town to architecture in the state. It's an important building on that site and developing an architecture that responded appropriately was, was very important to us. It's an interesting project when it was built as a art museum for it to be so clearly residential in character, right? To, to look at replicating an antebellum home as an art museum. The galleries, the wide open, the, the porches, this notion of being able to use it for uses that might take advantage of an inside and outside relationship in a way that most art museums can't or won't, um, I think is interesting. Biaxial symmetry with the house was important. So when you enter our new building, you enter along a covered walkway, but that biaxial symmetry extends through Hayes Town's house, through the site, out the back and then to our lobby. We really saw the town pavilion as the first sculpture in a sculpture garden that we could create by siting this new museum behind it. All of the architectural decisions then that were made on the new building worked to complement by contrast the historic house. So the glass has a wide spectrum of um, material qualities. It can be opaque, uh, it can be very transparent, but it's unique in that it almost never is either one or the other, it's always both simultaneously. And so at any time during the day or night, the glass reflects back the house in the facade, so you, you end up with this interesting dialogue between the two because one is always present in the face of the other. And driving down the street, you can always tell a Hayestown house next to the other lovely homes, uh, I think because of the proportions. The art masters all use proportions to compose their work. Hayes had that sense, I believe, uh, as an artist. And he referred to himself in numerous conversations with me that he's considered himself more of an artist than an architect. Hayes worked with any piece of property. He, he was such a, an artist. And his proportions, I think, are second to none because there are many that tried to copy town homes, but uh, they didn't have the eye. It's clear that he has studied historic architecture, uh, doing measure drawings for um, uh, historic building surveys and the like. And he basically uh, subsumed this understanding of proportion and scale and how materials go together by virtue of having done those drawings and done those surveys. And he took all that in and then created a new architecture that was his own. Even in his houses, we'd drive up and he'd say, gal, what's wrong? And I'd say, oh, the chimney is way too tall. And he's like, you're right, it's too tall. They have two courses too many, take it down. And the bricklayer would have to go up there and take two courses off. Or we'd, or we'd drive up somewhere and he'd say, what'd you see? And I'd have to guess what was wrong. And it was all proportion and scale. When he got very old, just before he quit working. Uh, he was in his 90s. And uh, my brother said, I got worried about him 
being able to see drawing those little lines and having to have them be exactly so many inches and everything. So he said, I went over there, and as he drew a line, I said, Daddy, how big is that room going to be? And Daddy said, seven feet, six inches. He said, I'd take the slide rule out, and there it was, seven feet and six inches. He said he had drawn lines so long, he knew exactly how long to draw a line. It was interesting. I had none of that talent. We are in our parents' home, and they built the home in 1982, and they knew Mr. Town through a lot of homes uh, that my dad did work in and just had a great appreciation for his work. Sometime in the 70s, my parents were at Versailles and saw um, La Hemo de la Reine, and fell in love with it. Came home, brought a lot of pictures, met with Mr. Town and said, this is what we would like for our home and we would like for you to design it. I mean, at the time that the house was being built, I was probably 11, 11 and 12 years old. And it seems like whenever they were building the house that it, it seems like they worked on the foundation for quite a long time. I mean, there was a lot of work that had to be done just for that part. Um, I would say more than an ordinary house. So I remember coming out here over the course of many weeks or months with my dad and coming out in the mornings and checking on the job. And it was fun, you know, just roaming through the house and running up the staircase that you see now, you mm -hmm. know, going to see what your what had been done to your room that day and, you know, what what were the different views mm -hmm. going to look like. Everywhere you look, it's another little vista. I think it became a home in the process while it was being built, even before we moved in. I know there are things um, that my parents wanted in this house that Mr. Town might not have necessarily done that way, but, um, I, you know, I think he understood and he wanted to make them happy. My mother wanted larger paned windows throughout the house, but especially in the solarium off of the kitchen. She wanted to feel when she was cooking like she was in a big tree house. And so that's what she got. She got her big tree house. You know, just the finishes are just so warm. All the, um, you know, the flooring that's used, the antique pine, the, you know, antique tiles. Uh, Haystown's work is just timeless. Most people that I know that are interested in buying a Hayes house that are young, um, a lot of them grew up in a Hayes house or they had a friend who grew up in a Hayes house and they have such fond memories and happy memories of living there. The house originally belonged to the Horace Rickey senior family. Uh, Mr. Rickey was a huge contractor here in Lafayette. Um, and Mr. Rickey bought this piece of property uh, and then Mr. Town later uh, designed his home for him, which he built himself. When we bought the house and we talked to Beth Rickey, uh, who was Mr. Rickey's daughter, and she found out that we had four kids at the time, it made her so happy because she said, this, is, this house was built for a family. My daddy, who she called Papa, um, when he built this house in 1962, it was supposed to be a family house. Sadly, he died in 1968, and so Beth was so excited that all of a sudden the house was gonna come alive again. The rooms are arranged um, in such a manner that they just easily flow from one room to the next. When we first moved in the house and we didn't have furniture, you know, I'd many times find the boys on their little, you know, tricycles and scooters and just going around in a big, you know, square from the living room to the foyer to the den to the kitchen, dining room back in here, and it just flowed. We have five kids now, and uh, there were four at the time when we moved in. The kids loved it. They know we had a huge yard, front yard, back yard. We had the porches, which they call galleries. Um, and they just a lot of room. Uh, so it's been a great house for kids. When we bought the house, I would have people that I really didn't know, uh, interior designers, just people that lived around town. 
And they would stop me and say, oh, we, we heard you're buying, you know, the Haystown house on Gerard Park Drive. Let me tell you something, the drapes in the front rooms, <laughs> do not touch them. Do, you know, uh, I don't know if you know, but they're very valuable, you know, English uh, hand-blocked linen that Mr. Town uh, accompanied Miss Ricky to New Orleans to H. Stern to pick out the, uh, you know, the fabric. Of course, I'm so glad that I listened to their advice because uh, the drapery is one of my favorite things about the room. The biggest advice or recommendation I would give to someone moving into a Hayes townhouse is don't, and this is my uh, word, don't dehaze it. So many times you want to go in and you want to make it look like something else. Hayes Town does not build a house that needs to be decorated. He builds a house that needs to be filled. For, you know, for a standard residential house, I think it's a little unusual to have uh, interior wall elevations of pretty much most of, the, most of the major rooms and cross sections of the house. And, and uh, you know, they're a beautifully done set of plans. I grew up uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, loving Hayes Town's works. My dad was a friend of his. And actually one of the best memories uh, with my dad was uh, walking to a construction site where one of Mr. Town's uh, houses in the neighborhood was being built. So just the, the name, uh, knowing who designed it was an instant attraction to me. Uh, when you walk in the front door, there's almost a hundred foot long, awful lot of rooms. Uh, and there's just a richness of texture and your eyes drawn back to uh, bookcases in this instance from the front door. With a background in architecture, um, you know, the, I always had an interest in um, access ways and, and sight lines, and, and I think that was what I particularly found. Plus the um, exterior, the regional uh, vernacular that he, he really brought back to life, I think. Uh, it's wonderful. It was difficult for me to think about changing anything. I felt like the room that we're sitting in, which is, would have been the formal living room, uh, there was one large opening to it, but it was a dead end. And that may have been something that was standard for 1960 when this was built. There was a closet in the family room, and I think it maybe is his own house where there is a opening with a wall of books. And so that's what I was thinking of with the books there. And then the door opens into the family room and whether Mr. I don't know if Mr. Town planned it this way, but it's almost on perfect axis with the fireplace in the family room. So it, it was almost as if it was meant to be that way. My name is Wendy Parrish. I live in the old Dewey house. It was built in 1939 in New Iberia, Louisiana. When you are in the home and you look to the front, you can see outside. You look to the back, you can see outside. There are windows all over. It's, it's a feeling of peace and freedom, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. The house is very, very open. Uh, it's, it's easy to get around in, and my grandkids love it. They call it the three circles. There's three circles in the house. And you can do the circle through the dining room, you can do the circle through the sitting room, and then the circle through the bedrooms. And they play tag and hide and seek, and it's just- In the uh, house. It's a mad house. <laughs> There's at least two doors to every room, so they have a lot of fun. The den is a four inch concrete slab that is suspended 30 inches above the ground on pillars. It's a very large room. You walk in there and it's got slate on the floor, okay? That's grouted in, but it's not sitting on the ground. It's 30 inches off the ground. Uh, my name is Lisa Dewey Lord, and my grandparents, Lambert and Gertie, owned um, an A. Hayes town home in New Iberia. Gertie was quite a character. She was a very special lady. We have memories of cooking with my grandmother on those stainless steel countertops. <laughs> 
she'd pull up a, she'd pull up a, a stool and we'd stand on the stools and, and we'd help her cook in that fabulous kitchen because she was quite the chef. Most of our get togethers or most of our time was spent in the den. Uh, Mike and Wendy spoke about the den, the beautiful slate floor. We always had to be careful when you run because you didn't want to hit your head on the slate floor. And my grandparents also had a huge table that was the exact same slate from the floor. The first time I went to visit Mike and Wendy in, in the home, I, um, it was really heartwarming to see that so much of the house was still the same. You know, all the built-ins were still there. The beautiful library wall was still there. None of that wood had been painted over. Um, you know, all of that, those little unique things, no one will be able to appreciate the beauty if people like them don't preserve it. One of the hardest things on living in a Hayes townhouse is trying to maintain it and preserve it. You're almost paralyzed as to what to do. Well, Hayes had uh, a phrase he would use, at least I heard him say several times, of uh, benign neglect. And that's where uh, to have a patina, an aged patina on certain materials, uh, the wood is aged and it looks wonderful and it's beautiful. And if it's on the north side, it'll get that bright green, tiny flakes of moss growing on it. And it's, it's just beautiful. And it's beautiful on the fence, it's beautiful on siding. But given time, the wood uh, gets eaten and, and destroyed by things like that. Uh, and so I've, I've been asked to repair uh, and renovate uh, several houses and or numerous houses, but it's uh, with respect. It's a terrible uh, uh, burden to try to maintain in the same manner in which Mr. Town would be pleased if he walked in to see it again. Scale, proportion, and material qualities of a town project are quite distinct. And it's very difficult to replicate that if you don't have the the training and the background and you haven't assimilated the true history on which it's based in the way in which he has. Hayes understood the, and appreciated the, the richness of culture. It's a little dirty, it's not all clean, not always. The benign neglect uh, gives you some of that, but it's uh, something that is very valuable that architecture can capture or erase, and he chose to capture it. You go through life and you count your friends. Hayes Town absolutely is way up there. Because, and I don't think I'm the only person. I think he established that with all of his clients. Well, he truly loved his customers. They became his friends. And uh, he, he'd have a special relationship with them and their families and their children and their grandchildren. When they had weddings and funerals, they called him. He just, he loved them and they loved him. Two-way street. You can see the, hopefully the personality of each of his clients as he progressed uh, through the years, decades really, in, in designing all of these houses. Architecture dies if it's static. Uh, so it has to grow, it has to change. And so it won't, hopefully people can take these structures and update them uh, for life as it changes. But I think the houses are elastic enough, and I like to think that Mr. Town would want them to be that way as well. Uh, hopefully he wouldn't want them preserved in amber. My take on his life, and on him personally, is that he wasn't afraid. He would try it. If it didn't work, you take the palette knife, you scrape it off, do it again. And you do it until you get it right. And he, he wasn't afraid, he wasn't a perfectionist. That He wasn't that domineering type A, you did it wrong, I, I'm mad at you. Let's just figure it out. Let's just do this till it works. He, to me, uh, is the epitome of a father figure that I really attached myself to. I had so much respect and regard and love for him through the years. It was just a wonderful experience to work with with him. Well, I just learned from him, but he was the one with the talent. He was extremely talented. He had a, 
architectural professor from LSU who worked with him. And he came one day and he says, you know, your dad is really good, but you know what the truth is? That he doesn't realize how good he is. In other words, he was proud of what he did, but he didn't realize how good he really was, because he really was unbelievable. The value stands up for years and years and years. The feeling and the craftsmanship and the materials and the way you live in it, it's just a place for people to enjoy living.